Hi, my name is Rebecca Christofferson, and I'm an assistant professor at Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine, and I study arbivirology. Arbivirology is the most fun virology, or that's at least what we say. So what is arbivirology? Arbivirology is the study of arboviruses. And the term arboviruses comes from arthropod-borne viruses. Arthropods are, of course, things like insects or ticks, and they are vectors of these arthropod-borne viruses, and that means that they transmit them. So some example of arboviruses that you may be familiar with are yellow fever virus, West Nile virus, dengue virus, Zika virus, and those are all flaviviruses, or alpha viruses like chikungunya or Myara virus. And then there's another set of viruses that I study, which are Bunya viruses, like Rift Valley fever virus, lacrosse virus, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, or the ones that we're particularly interested in, Bunya muera, Betai, and Ingari viruses. Particularly in my lab, we study arbovirus transmission. And arbovirus transmission is made up of a milieu of questions that encompass the virus, the vertebrate, and the vector. So again, when we're talking about arbovirus, arbovirology, it's this whole interconnectedness of the system that goes into transmission and how transmission shapes up. We also have the added component of the environment. And I'll explain later in this talk how the environment acts on this interaction of vector, vertebrate, and virus to sort of shape how an epidemic might look. When I talk about epidemic shapes, what I'm, looking, uh, what I'm looking at is just that, the shape. So here are three randomly generated epidemics, and you can have one like this blue that starts out way over here and has a really long burn in, and then kind of turns into this epidemic and then has a really long tail this way. Or you have something like the yellow, which starts about right here. It has a shorter burn in, but a higher peak, and it disappears, also a little shorter. And then you have something like explosive outbreaks, like we've seen in the past few decades with chikungunya and Zika viruses in, in the Americas, that start out and they just come in and they go all the way to the top and then they burn out. And so those are the different shapes of an epidemic. And in my lab, what we're interested in is how are these dynamics of transmission determined by the interactions of the transmission system, which are the mosquito virus interactions, the vertebrate virus interactions, and then the environment virus mosquito interactions. What is a vector? Well, I've already told you a vector is something that transmits these pathogens, in my case, viruses. So there are many types of, um, or many species that can act as vectors. The main ones being, for me, um, mosquitoes, which I'll tell you a lot about mosquitoes, ticks, we have here um, sand flies, which are implicated in like leishmaniasis, and then we have biting midges that um, are responsible for things like blue tongue virus. Ticks, as we all know, can transmit um, several viruses, but also bacterial agents. But I'm going to focus on mosquitoes because I love mosquitoes. So some trivia for the next time you're at a party that you will love to, to, to spout off is that there are about 3,500 different species of mosquitoes and 132 species of 80s mosquitoes. I primarily study 80s mosquitoes and their associated arboviruses. Here's an interesting tidbit, is that only the ladies bite you. Mosquitoes, um, as a food source, actually uh, drink nectar, so they're pollinators. When the female bites you, it's not because she's hungry, it's because she needs your protein in your blood to then make eggs and make little baby mosquitoes. And so when you see um, a mosquito biting you, it's going to be a female. Some more trivia, because this is always interesting, is that males are really, really fuzzy. So here you see their antenna, really, really fuzzy. And their proboscis tends to have sort of like little decorations on the end. So they'll have like this fleur-de-lis thing going on. The females, they tend to be a little bit bigger and their pro proboscis, which is this, uh, this thing right here, it's their little sippy straw, the thing that they suck your blood with, it's, it's just straight. And their uh, antenna are a lot less fuzzy. And so if you really want to hang around and learn how to suck the mosquito, be my guest. But if you see it on you and it's biting you, it's a girl. So one of the major things we study in vector-borne or mosquito-borne particularly, arbovirus transmission is vector competence. Vector competence is the intrinsic ability of a specific vector to transmit a specific pathogen. And it's often mathematically uh, represented as the number, that trans the number of mosquitoes that transmit divided by the total number that you are exposed. 
And so what I'm going to talk about today is how we determine a good way to look at vector competence, but also I'm going to tell you physically how we do it in the lab. So um, interesting, not all mosquitoes that get exposed to a virus will eventually become infectious. And so we kind of have this, this whole like um, uh, filter, which is time, that determine given I, I exposed 100, maybe only 60% of them will actually transmit given a certain amount of time. That time component is called the extrinsic incubation period. It's the time between exposure of the mosquito to an infectious blood meal to the mosquito is actually transmitting. And I'll probably say EIP a lot. That's what I'm talking about, extrinsic incubation period. So again, how do I measure it? Do I measure it at one time point, at two time points? Does it really matter? And then how physically do we do this in the lab? One of the things I noticed when I was first starting out on my vector competence journey of life was that there was sort of a bias in sampling at 7 and 14 days post-exposure. So this is from a paper where we looked at um, chikungunya vector competence in the literature. And we found, so you can see here, we found that there's a lot of people sampling at 7 days and then again at 14 days. And you can see it here, this is in a separate mosquito species. But the way that these lines, these are data points. How many data points per time point? And so you see there's this really kind of propensity to measure at 7 and 14. Well, why do we do 7 and 14? Well, just one week and two weeks is kind of easy to talk about. And it's really sort of historical, sort of an artifact. There's no biological um, basis for 7 and 14 days. So again, how do we measure it? Well, it's a process vector competence. So what I have been trying to champion is that we really need to understand the temporal component of vector competence. For example, this is some data out of my laboratory in some um, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes looking at Zika virus. And these are the days post-exposure. So we give mosquitoes a blood meal that has Zika in it, and then we test them over time. We test a subset of them over five days post-exposure all the way to 23. And this is the percent that had virus in their saliva. So you see we start out with zero, we get some at 10%, and all of a sudden we're at 60%. But if I had measured at seven and 14 days, then I really would say maybe 10% is the max, or 10% is vector competence. But we're really not getting to the 60% there. So again, what is a good way to do this? This is the same data in graphical form. And so what I wanted to kind of show you here is that if we look at 7 and 14 days, which I put on this graph as um, dotted lines, it doesn't capture the whole story. But what if I were to say 10 days or 20 days or 15 days? My point being, any combination of one or two discrete time points that are somewhat arbitrarily chosen are really not going to tell the whole story of this process of vector competence. And so what we do in my laboratory is we fit a distribution to the data. And I've been doing vector competence for a long time, and I found that the cumulative logistic distribution, or some people a sigmoid curve, fits the, fits the data more often than not. And you do this by a magic thing called statistics, which is not as scary or as boring as people make it out to be. But you find you get this really nice curve. And then what you can do with this curve is just basic arithmetic or basic algebra. And you find the point at which this curve is equal to 50%. And then that defines the EIP 50, or the extrinsic incubation period 50. In this case, the EIP 50 is 16.6 .6 days post-exposure. Now, what does this mean? The EIP50 is the time it takes for 50% of mosquitoes to become infectious. And it's a similar concept to something like the lethal dose 50 or LD50, which is used a lot in um, toxicology and um, vertebrate studies, or lethal concentration 50 or tissue culture infectious dose 50. These are all measures where you apply some, a treatment to a system, and then you look for 50% of your required or outcome infection or lethality or whatever. And so it's the same concept, but it makes sense because it allows us to sort of um, tailor our experiments to our particular system. Um, what does that mean? Okay, so let's compare. This is the same data, but all I did was add um, 10 days 
to the days post exposure because it's easy, 10 is easy, I can do that. And um, I have to fight with sixth grade math homework, so I tend to make things easy for myself. So EIP 50 here is 26.6 days. It's the same logistic, uh, the same logistic uh, function, and we solve for 50%. What does this mean? So if we look at the two data, the red and the purple, this is our original and this is the one we added, the data points here start at 8 and go all the way to 20, 23. So that defines our period of sampling for, for that particular system. If we were to start at day 8 for the purple line, we're actually not going to see transmission until day 18. That's a lot of mosquitoes and a lot of sampling and a lot of time and resources for something that you're just going to get a bunch of zeros. So what you can do is if you're planning a really big experiment, you can do a small pilot study and get an idea of when your virus starts to sort of follow this upward path and tailor when you sample or the times you sample on this x-axis. That is a really good way to save, um, again, time and resources. But the EIP50 the EIP50 lets you compare regardless of if your x-axis or your sampling time points, uh, sampling time points um, match. So why is this useful? Well, let's say, for example, you have a student who is working really, really hard and has this really big experiment coming up or in process, and they're doing all the work and doing a really good job, and then an epic flood hits and you can't get to work. True story. So that last time point, that involves hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes, lots of tears, lots of blood, sweat, and tears. I can say blood because we feed them blood. But now we don't have to scratch the whole experiment because we can use this to sort of say, well, even though we're off on that one day on the x-axis, the EIP50 still standardizes how we can compare all this data. So physically, how do we get the virus into the mosquito? Do we use very tiny spoons? That would be a no. We tried. We didn't really try. So we use something called a hematech. This is the best invention ever. It's from a lab, uh, Discovery Labs in the United Kingdom. And it's basically an artificial membrane feeding system where we put blood into um, a little disc and we put a membrane on, on the bottom to hold the blood in. And it heats it up to 37 degrees Celsius, which is approximately body temperature for, uh, for people. And then we stick it on top of a carton full of mosquitoes, screen, blood meal. Mosquitoes come up, they probe through the screen to the blood meal, and then they get big and fat and juicy and red. At this point, we take the mosquitoes that are big and fat and juicy and red, and we put those into a new carton because we know these mosquitoes have been exposed. They've gotten the blood meal that has whatever in it that we want them to have. And so now we can look at things like vector competence. How do we get it back out? Well, we take the mosquitoes, we flash freeze them in a freezer, uh, and then we take their legs and their wings off. And then we stick their bodies onto tape with the sticky side up, and then we take a really thin pipette and we thread their proboscis through this pipette. Now this solution right here has ATP in it, which is adenosine triphosphate, and that's one of the energy building blocks of, of respiration in our body and everything. That is actually what stimulates salivation in the mosquito. So ATP in this solution right here is making that mosquito spit. So that's how we get it out. And then we test it using a very um, in a varied repertoire of methods to see if there's RNA from our viruses or if there's actually infectious viruses. So now I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about zoonoses. Zoonoses are important to arboviruses because most arboviruses are zoonoses. It's estimated that vector-borne diseases and zoonotic diseases make up 70 to 75 percent of emerging uh, pathogens of public health importance in the, in the future. And so, like I said, most arboviruses are zoonoses. A zoonotic disease is one where humans are not the primary reservoir, uh, primary vertebrate host. Um, a non-human vertebrate is the primary host, and it's often um, associated with like a natural sort of habitat. So some examples are West Nile, where the primary vertebrate host are birds, yellow fever, and the primary uh, vertebrate host, or the reservoir host, we call it, is a non-human primate. Usutu virus, which is a, a, like West Nile um, in uh, Europe, is also, is also um, the reservoir host is birds. Uh, 
And then tick-borne encephalitis is uh, the reservoir is rodents. And then dengue, Zika, and chikungunya, it's probably primates. Although some zoonotic diseases have come out of the natural or sylvan cycle, which I'll explain in a minute, and come into urban transmission and are maintained primarily there without a whole lot, not a whole lot of input from the sylvatic cycle. Dengue is one of those. It exists happily in an urban cycle without the input from that sylva sylvatic cycle. So what does all that mean? Well, to explain, I'm going to tell you about the case of yellow fever. Yellow fever um, is maintained in the sylvatic cycle. Sylvatic comes from a word meaning jungle, and it's basically just that. It's mostly found in non-human primates, and they're associated uh, jungle mosquitoes of, in South America, it's the Haemagogus genera. And so it's maintained happily, just keeps going, doesn't generally cause high mortality in, uh, in the non-human primates. We call the non-human primates, again, the reservoir host, and we call the associated sylvan vector the enzootic vector. So it's maintained in this big old sylvatic silva cycle. So what happens, how does it get into a human outbreak? Because we've had several yellow fever outbreaks of pretty big uh, magnitude in the last couple of decades. So what happens is, generally, we have something called a spillover event. And that is when usually something we refer to as a bridge vector comes from the sylvatic cycle into an urban area, infects, you know, patient zero in the urban cycle. At that point, then yellow fever establishes a sort of independent urban cycle where the, the bridge vector may or may not be the same vector here but it is not the same vector as in here. So these are two discrete cycles that are bridged by a bridge vector. Now that being said, yellow fever in Brazil in this last big outbreak was found to have more transmission associated with the sylvatic vector than with what we think is the urban vector. And so that indicates that there are multiple spillover events that have, that have contributed to this outbreak. And so spillover events and emergence from the sylvan to the urban cycle is never a one-to-one -one or a single event. It's always a spectrum. Some of the other things about arbovirology that makes it really interesting are the impacts of environment. And since we're dealing with the constant sort of plague of climate change and development, we really have to think about what is the environment how is the environmental changes that we're expecting impact what we see with arbovirus transmission? So we do this through laboratory studies, but also there are some field observations that kind of make the point. So the laboratory studies we have been conducting are the Zika and temperature. And a lot of other labs have been looking at this. And generally what we know is that an increase in temperature increases vector competence. It means that more mosquitoes will become infectious, and the time it takes for that to happen generally is shorter. But that's not the whole picture, because temperature also affects the life traits of the mosquito. So what we've been looking at is two uh, temperatures. One is 24 degrees, which is relatively mild, and 28 degrees, which is pretty optimal for Zika and Aedes mosquitoes. And if we expose these two sets of mosquitoes at the same time, three days post-emergence, which is a three-day-old adult, and we then put them at two different temperatures, what we find is that we have to look at transmission and the mortality rate or survival time of the mosquito in order to really understand vector competence in its totality. So we found the minimum time to transmission for um, this system was 27 days, which is pretty long. The average lifespan of the mosquito at this point is 32.4 days. At 28 degrees, we had a 14-day uh, minimum time to transmission, and we had a lifespan of 28 and a half to, uh, days. So what does this mean? So again, this is not the EIP 50 that I've been talking about. This is minimum time to transmission. So what we have now is a difference in the maximum potential days of transmission that is attributable to temperature only, because this is the same mosquitoes and the same virus. We have five and a half days of maximum potential transmission at lower temperatures, while we have 14 and a half days of maximum potential transmission at what we call the optimal temperature. Now, if we up the temperature and the mosquitoes start dying too fast, then we, we, um, then we have to look at the trade-off between that decreased EIP and the 
faster time to death for the mosquitoes. And generally there comes a point where the mortality rate of the mosquitoes will win out and that advantage that you get from the viral standpoint of higher temperature equals more virus out quicker is lost because the mosquitoes just don't live long enough. So the case of West Nile and the drought. This was something that was interesting in 2012. There was a really big drought, especially we were um, looking in Dallas. There was a big, big drought, and then there was also a really big increase of West Nile cases in humans. And this was puzzling for a couple of reasons. One is that we know, because I've told you, that the uh, West Nile is a zoonotic disease, and it's maintained in this bird mosquito cycle. So birds and Culex mosquitoes, um, that live both in really urban centers, but also in peri-urban or suburban areas. Culex mosquitoes like to breed in water. They like, stand, they like puddle water, dirty water, sewage water, just water in the ground. As long as it's still and it's wet, they will lay their eggs. And so when we had this drought and we had this increase in West Nile cases, we sort of were thinking, well, there's less water, so there should be less mosquitoes because there's not a lot of place for them for them to breed. However, what we ended up looking at or ended up um, sort of as a community coming to a census is that we have what's called water source crowding. And what that meant was that the birds and the mosquitoes moved into town because the most reliable source of water was man-made sources. And we had anecdotally Culex mosquitoes breeding in places they don't usually breed, which are at the, at the edges of uh, man-made water, water features or water fountains. And so what that did is it brought this cycle of intense transmission between birds and mosquitoes closer to humans. And so humans just become an incidental um, result of being close to that transmission cycle. And so that was one way that the environmental um, effects really drove the dynamics of West Nile virus in people that year. So what did we learn? We learned that arboviruses is the study of arthropod transmitted viruses. We learned that vector competence is the measure of transmission capability for the vector. And it's a combination of vector, vertebrate, virus, and the environment. And what else did we learn? We learned that arbovirology is virology at its most fun. Thank you.